What is Christian apologetics? Does it still serve a purpose? What is the best way to go about it? Defending the Christian faith surely changes in terms of technique and approach given changes in culture, or does it? Uh, we're joined by two guests today to talk about that and much more on today's Theology on Air. I'm, as always, Evan McClanahan. I'm the pastor at First Lutheran down in Houston, Texas. Uh, been working with Theology on Tap for a number of years, which is an you know, evangelism and apologetics kind of ministry. We look at culture and Bible and theology and social issues. Um, we do it in person every other month around craft beer. That's Theology on Tap. So go to HoustonTOT.com to learn about us, learn how you can support us, attend events, that sort of thing. And this is our weekly uh, podcast where we get to sort of do deeper dives or more more often, dives more often, you might say, on a variety of other topics. So uh, Sarah couldn't be with us tonight, unfortunately. She's uh, doing lots of work at Memorial Drive Presbyterian Church these days, which you should check out. Uh, but again, I'm uh, I'm over at First Lutheran. This is Theology on Air. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined by two guests tonight. Uh, one is uh, Nathan Greeley, and the other is Myron Bradley Penner. And you know, I should have recorded that whole story we just had. But suffice to say, there are two Myron Penners in Western Canada that both have PhDs and virtually the same topic and cover the same ground. It's 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 weird. So I had this whole rigmarole of finding the correct Myron Penner, although the other one could probably come on our podcast and talk about something as well. But this particular My, uh, Myron Penner, he's the rector at St. Paul's Anglican in Alberta. He's the father to Abigail, Sophia, and Isabella. Uh, he has a PhD in philosophy, and he's the author of the book, The End of Apologetics. Uh, Nathan Greeley is the author of Christian Apologetics, a Lutheran introduction. He's a teacher at Acacia, hope I said that right, Acacia Academy, a Christian classical school in Kokomo, Indiana and an instructor uh, in philosophy at Indiana, um, yeah, Indiana Wesleyan University. My font is too small uh, from what I'm reading on off my, I need one of those, you That's know, fine. big Joe, Joe Biden uh, things, you know, like the massive letters, you know, to, but anyway, don't have one of those. So uh, thank you both very much for, for joining me on, uh, on this weeknight. And why don't we just dive in? Uh, Nathan, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, nominate you to go first. Just give us kind of some background, maybe how you got into apologetics. And um, I do want to ask about kind of if there's a kind of Lutheran apologetic. Um, we could we could talk about that for a long time, I'm sure. But uh, with with deference to the Anglican that's joined us, I don't want to spend too much time on that. But just how'd you get into it, and kind of what school would you say that you're in? That well, is school of apologetics. I grew up a Christian and attended church on a regular basis, and, and was a, a pretty. Um, typical evangelical, American evangelical kid growing up. And then I became a non-believer as a teenager, um, which is also pretty typical these days. Um, and then in my mid twenties, I started taking some philosophy classes in, in uh, college and got really interested, really um, found a lot of the things that I was reading about quite fascinating. And I also started to think at that point, questions about what I was doing with my life, existential kinds of questions, um, you know, what the purpose of everything is, and, and these kinds of questions. And so I naturally, or unsurprisingly, I would say, I turned back to looking at theology and looking at uh, religion and reading as much as I could about those subjects and, and trying to figure out um, what I could believe and what made sense. and. Um, where I could find purpose, where I could find a sense of um, identity and meaning. And uh, it was a long, uh, a long journey uh, that took a lot of twists and turns. Um, I dabbled a little bit in, in just about every different, you know, theological movement or school, um, read lots of apologists writing from different points of views, um, liberals, conservatives, uh, Protestants, Catholics, just all kinds of people. And eventually, um, it was a slow process. It wasn't like I, I had some kind of like, uh, you know, instantaneous reconversion or anything like that. But eventually, through engaging with um, a lot of helpful sources, a lot of helpful resources, um, I was brought back to a, a position of 
um, feeling like, you know, I was a believer, feeling that I was um, um, somebody who placed my faith in Christ and believed in God and believed in Christ's deity and the resurrection and things like that, uh, the authority of scripture. And a, a big part of that, of the things that, that got me to that point um, were apologetic resources, but also um, just fellowship with other Christians or, or fellowship with believers who definitely steered me in different ways and, and kind of directed my steps at different points, um, recommended things and uh, made points and, and uh, arguments and things like that that were helpful and that helped clarify things for me. So um, I ended up returning to Christianity and I was actually an Episcopalian for, for a few years and then became Lutheran um, about six years ago, seven years ago. Cool. So as far as my approach goes, um, yeah. initially when I first started coming back to Christianity, I was really interested in postmodernism and really interested in continental philosophy and things like that. Um, I was really into Kierkegaard and Wittgenstein and um, also, I found like post-liberal theology pretty interesting, um, like Fry and uh, Lindbeck and people like that. Um, but I came to feel like I needed something that wasn't just a, a matter of, it, it had to be something objective for me, something that I was not just kind of like um, making a, a whimsical kind of choice or an arbitrary choice to be something instead of something else. You know, mm -hmm. or, you know, it had to, for me, there had to be some kind of um, external uh, constraints or, or some kind of leading that was going on so that I felt that what I was doing made sense and was, was rational and, and uh, something that a responsible person should be doing. Um, it wasn't just a matter of like kind of projecting myself or wanting to, um, to embrace something simply because it suited me. It had to be something that I felt um, actually stood up to criticism, you know, really rather strenuous mm -hmm. criticism. So um, for me, you know, traditional Orthodox Christianity, I, I found myself in a place where I was able to affirm that it could do that. And a lot of that had to do with some of the apologists I was reading, the, the, what I would consider the, the better apologists. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's obviously there's a range. Um, yeah. Who, who would you maybe list three apologists that you read and really you know, benefited from or your favorites, maybe? Um, ones I really like, I really like Peter Kreeft, who's a Roman Catholic philosopher from, uh, he was at Boston College, he's retired now. Mm -hmm. um, John Warwick Montgomery uh, had had a role, definitely, in my thinking. Um, and I was going to ask you about him because of, he's kind of the one other than you now, the kind of Lutheran <laughs> who's out there yeah. kind of doing well, apologetics. He's, he's, he's you know. the guy, I'm, I'm yeah. you know just a yeah. coattail writer, really. Um, so he was also important for me. Um, mostly in terms of apologetics, I've benefited mostly from um, Roman Catholics and, uh, mm. and then some Lutherans and uh, evangelicals. But, um, you know, there's this, I, there's this like pop apologetic, pop evangelical, apologetics industry and um that's something that hasn't held a lot of appeal or allure for me it's not that it's not i, I think that there's a lot of good things that those people do that, that are kind of involved with that but um i was i've always been more interested i guess in people that were uh apologists that had a really strong like historical foundation and historical theology and things like that so Mm -hmm. That was part of the reason I think why the, the Roman Catholics always appealed to me is because they seem to always have a pretty good grasp of, of history. Um, I also liked yeah. Alvin Plantinga has, has definitely uh, been somebody I've appreciated too. So yeah. I guess I would say those three cool you know, different, different aspects of what they've said and what they've uh, written about have really appealed to me. Yeah. And then Lewis, of course. Um, but yeah. uh, I think, um, I think Kreef does a really good job of channeling kind of like what's great about Lewis in a lot yeah. of his stuff. And it's a bit more rigorous too. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
Well, Myron, let's get you in here. I uh, I mentioned before we started recording, I, I remembered you from an uh, episode of Unbelievable mm-hmm. many years ago. You were on with Sean McDowell, and your book is called The End of Apologetics. And I was probably going through a bit of a transition. I mean, I was kind of really interested in the evidential school for a number of years, read some William Lane Craig books, um, you know, and I kind of started to have some dissatisfaction with that approach, which I won't really go into. But so I thought what you had to say was interesting, like, you know, maybe, you know, maybe, um, well, just the the title of the book sort of says it all. So talk about your story, how you got into it, and maybe kind of the the grand thesis of your book. I mean, why why do you think we might be at the end of apologetics? Right. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. It's nice to meet you and meet Nathan for the first time. Um, uh, yeah, I grew up in what would certainly be called a fundamentalist community here in Canada. We could talk a long time about that community, which was quite a interesting community. But um, so I was raised in a what would sort of be a no name generic brand evangelical home. There was it was non denominational. The community was non denominational. If it was anything, it was sort of a sister school to Moody. So there was mm. a, that kind of deeper life emphasis. So um, grew up in a they, they they wore the label fundamentalism proudly on a you know that, that was something that they were very proud of. So that was the kind of uh, context that I was raised in. But it was a Canadian version of that. So it's a bit muted, a bit different. There's they were still super nice. Yeah, exactly. We still said sorry for everything. Okay. <laughs> no, so um, and actually, uh, Mark Knoll has done a really good job, I think, charting some of the differences between Canadian and American evangelicals. But uh, that's maybe a topic for a different day. So I grew up in that context, and I literally did, could not. I mean, it, it, I would have to have had to go completely out of my way to find someone to even say hello to that was not a professing born again believer. It it was a small town, small community. The town was divided literally into uh, one half of it was the Bible college and all the people there. So I grew up in that milieu and then about 17 years old, just started um, questioning my faith, not, not in a, in a way that was like, okay, you know, this is something that's been pretty easy for you. So is this what you're going to, be? Is this who you are? Because you're not going to be here forever. So I started asking questions, and I don't want to make this the whole topic of our our talk, but um, it, along the way, started diving into my dad's library, and he had some good resources. And I think I maybe had a conversation or two with him about it. But my, my big question was sort of two-pronged, is Christianity intellectually viable, and can it be mine? I remember that was, I mean, I think I might want to nuance those differently now, but that's definitely how I voiced those questions back then. And so I started reading, uh, first of all, C.S. Lewis, which was a big help, Mere Christianity, and then I read Francis Schaeffer, and then I got into apologetics, I went to Bible college, I discovered that there was a class called apologetics, I started reading all kinds of Norm Geiser, Gary Habermas, J.P. Moreland, Bill Craig, I mean, yeah, and I can't remember exactly who I read when because I pretty much read them all, but I had a voracious appetite for this. And what I discovered is a, that I wasn't as much of a jock as a dumb jock as I thought I was, (laughs) um, that I actually had a brain and wanted to think about stuff. Um, but also that, um, that, uh, there were people who had thought about these questions and that was like, a stunner to me because in the community that I grew up in, it was pretty much anti-intellectual uh, and that sort of radical type of fideism that, you know, mm-hmm. if you ask your questions and, you know, that's worldly kind of thing. De- right? de- define fideism. Oh, okay. Yeah. So fideism, it literally, the, from the root word fide is faith in Latin and it would be faithism. So it was just mm-hmm. kind of this idea that and it obviously there are so many different versions of it that the word itself loses its <laughs> meaning but yeah. in, in its sort of basic meaning uh it's that you you believe things on faith and you don't question um you don't reason yourself to faith you have faith and then there there is a whole range of views now that 
you could describe yeah. as Phidias. But um, I was talking about sort of the crass sort of Phidiasm, the, the ignorant Phidiasm that just says, you know, we don't think about things, we just believe mm -hmm. them. Yeah. And so I, that's, you know, for me, even to have the questions I was having was starting to put me on the margins of my community, right? So um, I, I discovered that that wasn't the case and that there was even people in the community that were, you know, willing to think about things. But one of the recurring themes is was this anti Kierkegaard thing that you would get, starting with Francis Schaeffer. Um, and I remember, I mean, he was giving me for the very first time in my life, uh, a, an intellectual history of the West. I'd never thought about these things. I had no idea that that you could sort of chart intellectual movements and how we got to where we are and why we think the way we do. And it was just fascinating to me. But Kierkegaard would always come and I'd be kind of like going, oh man, I like this guy. And then he would like drop the bomb on him. And it's like, he's so wrong. <laughs> he moves to the upper story and it's illegitimate and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And I was like, oh, right. Yeah, no, he's got to be right. Like, I, yeah. And then, you know, Norm Geisler, same thing, right? Just Kierkegaard is this radical fideist and faith only, and it makes no sense. And and so I was... Nathan's head is about to explode over here, so we got to be careful. So, no, well, I mean, it, it's I'm funny fine. because I had yeah. a kind of a similar uh, movement. I just didn't get, you know, you, you moved... I was a phase for you. I got stuck in the phase that you moved past. So, um, okay, let me let me just quickly the yeah. thing with so first of all, like if people wanted to read Schaefer, I think the God who is there would be. Yeah, that was the, the very first book I read of his. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. would be one we we might all recommend as a as a good. But is it is it the Kierkegaardian blind you know sort of leap of faith yeah. that uh, is that that was kind of the issue at the end of the day that Kierkegaard would yeah. would sort of. I don't remember it very well, but kind of the idea that nope, that was he yeah. moved to the upper story where he divorced faith from reason, and it was sheer right. irrationality and gotcha. and uh, yeah. So um, yeah, but Kierkegaard was somebody that I immediately, as soon as I read an explanation of what he was saying, I would connect with it, right? And mm -hmm. then it would be destroyed as nah, that's not right. So um, I well, I ended well, up let, let let me let me ask what what was it that. Or, I, I, sorry to interrupt, but no, no, it's fine. What, what, what kind of, what was the turning point where you maybe moved out of that phase or yeah. kind of got to that point where it was like, wait a minute, maybe you didn't want to read the next Bill Craig book or whatever. Yeah, I read a book by C. Stephen Evans called Existentialism: colon, The Philosophy of Despair and the Quest for Hope, and he charted out. He went through Camus, uh, sort of the modern uh, mid sort of post war existentialists. Um, and started with Kierkegaard, who's pre-war, obviously. He's the late 19th century. But then you've got in the, you know, 19, late 40s and, and 50s, in the 20th century, you have Albert Camus and, uh, and the French existentialist, and he went through um, Jean-Paul Sartre and um, uh, Dostoevsky, and this kind of, these existential questions that came around meaning and despair and the sort of, where uh, this hyper objectivity of modernity got us and these attempts to try to answer. And it's, at the end, Kierkegaard comes through and kind of puts it all together for him. He's a Christian philosopher. He's, a, he's I think, emeritus at Baylor now, but he was at Baylor. He's kind of been a few places. He had been the, Hong, the curator of the Hong Kierkegaard Library. He knows Kierkegaard frontwards and backwards. He disagrees. Uh, somewhat with my interpretation of Kierkegaard, just for the record. But uh, that book just fascinated me because it it just hit on all cylinders. So I thought, okay, there's something to this. And and I couldn't understand exactly what existentialism was. Um, and I ended up in a philosophy class at university. Uh, I went to university, um, was told, of course, by my community, I'd lose my faith because I was going to study philosophy. Um, and I, the first class I took was called Existentialism uh, and Phenomenology, and we read either or abridged version of Kierkegaard. And I remember um, having uh, a lecture by my very atheistic professor who we had had serious back and forth. I wouldn't say like fights, but we disagreed. All right? I'd always be pushing the, the Christian sort of point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, he gave this incredible lecture on 
on Kierkegaard's transition to faith, which is how I think is probably a much better rendering of what he's talking about when we say the leap of faith, because in mm -hmm. English, it doesn't communicate exactly what Kierkegaard is trying to say in the Danish. Um, but uh, he gave this incredible lecture and I went up and, and it was just great. And I was asking questions. I came up after class and we were talking and I was asking more questions. He was answering. And, and then I, at one point it just hit me and I looked at him and I said, Dr. Preuss, like, why aren't you a Christian? <laughs> Cause it just, mm -hmm. the way he laid it out was like, to me, it was like, wow, mm -hmm. that's amazing. And he looked at me a little bit stunned and he just said, because I don't want to be. And I remember at that point saying, I don't know what a Christian philosophy of life is supposed to do, except to bring somebody who encounters it to the point where they make a decision and say, I don't want it. I refuse it. He didn't like, and this was, to me, it was really significant because we had gone back and forth. He was a Hegel expert. Um, and I had taken an, I, another course from him called ancient philosophy. And we had gone back and forth about stuff and he always had reasons, right? I mean, he was a very, he's a very good professor. Uh, and he just looked at me and just said, I get it and I'm just not gonna do it. Hmm. Um, and so that was the moment where after that, I just started reading Kierkegaard and, and dove deep on that. Uh, but that was so, where so, I kind of got my, my permission to sort yeah. of say, I think, I think this is what I need to explore. It, it might be the avenue for me. Gotcha. So, but was that, would you say a turning point where you realized, huh, um, there are all these, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but there are all these yeah, existing fine. reason, you know, all these existing reasons to have faith in Christ. This guy knows them all backwards and forwards. He's heard everything yeah. and, and all the background besides. It but, was a slow transition. It wasn't like that okay, abrupt. Okay, I got you. Because yeah. I ended up doing a master's thesis on Plantinga and Kierkegaard. So what happened next for me philosophically is in my senior year, I took a philosophy of religion class with a theistic prof uh, who was the chair of our department, a Catholic uh, gentleman named uh, John Woods. And uh, he was brilliant. He still is brilliant. Um, his primary area is logic. But he at that point, because I'm old enough, that Plantinga had not written his warrant volumes yet, so we had his reason and belief in God. And he was throwing out this idea in class, in his lectures and stuff, this guy in, you know, down in Michigan, <laughs> this Christian philosopher talks about belief in God is properly basic. And I was like, what the heck is properly basic mean? <laughs> and then I had to start learning epistemology, right? I hadn't taken epistemology at that point. And uh, we, yeah, I started seeing immediately that he was the one of the things you can't do if you seriously read Kierkegaard is think that he's an anti intellectualist. He is extremely intelligent and he is he, he at one point in his theological studies, his brother Peter writes home to his dad and in despair and says, I, it, I don't know if Peter if Soren is reading any theology, all he seems to read these days is philosophy. Um, and so his brother was w wishing that yeah. he was reading theology, not philosophy. Uh, and so I, I encounter Plantinga and he seemed at the time to be articulating this kind of uh, rational this view of reason and belief in god that would be the sort of analytic version of what Kierkegaard is trying to say now my thesis i don't think was a complete success and i have a deep deep appreciation for planiga um but uh i would disagree with planiga especially yeah, but but kind of summarize so nathan can come back and yeah. and argue with you a little bit yeah, yeah, sure, sure. summarize kind of where what what would you say was the thing or if it can be synthesized and where you said all right some, something has changed here and i need to rethink my approach yeah for me it uh it's when i started reading uh the postmodern critiques of of modernity which planiga is exceptionally dismissive of and i was exceptionally dismissive of until i got to grad school um and it was actually while i was writing my thesis that i started reading derrida and foucault um, and started to understand Kierkegaard not in, as an analytic philosopher, which is what C. Stephen Evans kind of does, and as a kind of epistemologist, which he kind of is, because hermeneutics is also epistemology, but we won't, sorry, I'm getting off on that. But um, yeah, so for me, when I started to realize that Plantinga didn't quite go far enough in his critique of modern epistemology, he, he, he goes, what he says is right. And, and I believe deeply in 
uh, huge tracts of his warrant, uh, the current debate and warrant and proper function where he does uh, what is effectually a, a doxastic phenomenology, or he, he lays out uh, a, a theory about how we come to believe things, and that forms the basis on which he will say we're completely reasonable to believe a lot of things without having any good evidence for them. Uh, I still love that uh, that that boldness and brashness because mm -hmm. I think he's absolutely correct. Um, but he doesn't go far enough in that he still thinks that, and really it was the, the theological critique that, that combined with the, the the philosophical critique of modernity, which which emphasizes um, the the inability of human reason to draw a net around all of it and circle it in and say, yes, we got okay. a handle on it because we know that it's reasonable. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, well, Nathan, maybe kind of jump back in. It, that's, that's some fairly philosophical in the weeds type stuff. Y'all probably have Sorry. lost me a little bit, but that's okay. Um, for those who love philosophy, they'll be right on board, but maybe come back and kind of, I don't know, any thoughts on, on any of that? Or all of that. Um, well, in some ways, you know, I, I kind of went through some similar things myself, and, and had some similar thoughts at different points. Um, I guess I, I myself, I, I was really interested in postmodernism, like I said, and then I started to feel like a lot of it was just kind of uh, fallacious and. Um, not a lot of it was self-refuting and, and things like this like so that those are kind of like cookie cutter those are like typical critiques you might say of postmodernism. but give it give i a think quick, a lot of it's quite correct um give it wave give a quick definition of postmodernism if you can maybe most people understand postmodernism as the, the kind of cashing out of it would be something like relativism like there is no truth mm -hmm. or something like that but maybe give a uh, quick, i do think i do think it. that it does it is basically like a, a form of skepticism um that has arisen Due to kind of the, what you might call the the overreach of modernity or the, the epistemological overreach of modernity, um, modernity and, did what present present certain um, they, they sought to bring certainty to the world or you know everything can be done through right you know, the, the science idea method. that everything needs to um, be confirmed by you know evidence that's you know available to everybody um, okay. like uh, there's a 19th century writer named uh, Clifford who talks about how it's always wrong to believe something if you, unless you have sufficient evidence for it um, with the idea being that the only evidence that's going to actually count is empirical evidence. Um, okay. So that's kind of what I see as kind of the, um, the legacy of modernism. And mm -hmm. then postmodernism to the extent that it throws some cold water on that, you know, uh, that's great. But I think that postmodernism itself needs to kind of be moved past. I think it's kind of something that we need to go through and not just stay with. I think um, I myself would say that, you know, I, I kind of found myself getting drawn more and more to pre-modern philosophers like Augustine and, and Aquinas because um, I felt like they were somewhat immune from the kinds of criticisms that modernity or you know stereotypical modernist uh, philosophers were uh, susceptible to. Mm -hmm. And I thought that um, they also yet were still very reasonable and uh, you know they definitely valued um, the, the use of argument, the use of evidence. So I thought that they kind of presented kind of a happy, um, medium, you might say, between the extremes of modernism on one hand and postmodernism on the other. Um, so instead of like seesawing back and forth between those two options, you know, I was thinking, or I came to think that what was really needed was some like, like a critical pre-modernism or something like that, where you're kind of understanding these criticisms um, that the postmodernists are leveling, you're understanding what value there might be in them, but then you're also noticing their own shortcomings and the yeah. problems that, that with with those critiques, um, especially in their extreme forms, right? Yeah. That it just yeah. uh, definitely goes too far and it just ends up in abject skepticism and nihilism. And, um, and to avoid that, I think 
the, the best alternative is um, the kind of pre-modern thinking that was not, um, that understood that, um, you know, a lot of things need to be assumed. A lot of things have to be taken for granted if we're going to mm -hmm. know anything, right? Mm -hmm. So this whole modern quest for certainty is misguided. Um, and, and I think that's certainly right. But um, I think that uh, to, to follow the postmodernists and, and think that the, since we can't have certainty, all we can really have is, is you know, the opposite um, uncertainty about everything, um, I think is, um, is misguided too. So I think that what's needed is, is some kind of um, mean between those two things. Yeah. So what, what, so what, what would you say the role of apologetics is? I mean, in kind of a nutshell, what, I mean, you're, you're arguing for apologetics, more of the classical school, I would take it. So mm -hmm. arguments yeah. for, you know, the existence of God, if you're, if you're in the John Warwick school, uh, I would argue that school really begins more with history. I mean, he really right. believes, I mean, I would so argue he he's sort of on the, right. The resurrection, yeah. the reliability yeah. of the Bible. Sure. Those are the, that's yeah. his, his hallmarks. Um, yeah. And I think that, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with that approach, as long as it's, you know, I think if there's, like I said, a better way to do it, probably in a worse way, but um, to actually point to the evidence uh, that exists for these these beliefs um, in order to try to convince somebody that Christianity is worth taking seriously, uh, I think that's that's totally fine. I think really what I would define apologetics as is just um, persuading somebody to give Christianity a hearing, right? Or persuading somebody to listen to the Christian message um, mm -hmm. with with you know open ears or with you know um, with earnestness. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you can do that, then you're being successful in apologetics, I would yeah. say. So Myron, you're, you're opposed to people hearing Christianity. Is that what I understand when you write the book, The End of Apologetics? <laughs> yeah, you got me right, 100% yeah. right. Uh, yeah. uh, no, I, I actually quite the opposite. I think in the, the book, The End of Apologetics, I say that I'm writing in service to the truth of Jesus Christ. Um, and his life, death, and resurrection. So I, I'm, I, I'm not against uh, apologetics in total. I'm, I identify quite clearly that I'm against modern apologetics. And one of the problems that I think is even kind of surfaced in this conversation is that the term apologetics itself is kind of co-opted into a certain brand, right? And so I, I'm leery of the the apologetics brand, and so I'd like to get away from the apologetics mm. term. Not that I'm against being able to give an account of why, mm. which is really a much better way to translate that word. I know we like to translate apologia mm. as defense, and it's a legal defense. Eh, it's much more of being able to give an account. And that's what Peter is saying. Give an account of in First Peter three five when he says, "Always be ready to give an account for mm. the hope that's within you." In other words, say we met the risen Jesus, and He's changed yeah. our lives, and the Holy Spirit has transformed us. And that's really what Peter's talking about. He's not talking about you know the argument, yeah, for a yeah. Prime mover or something like yeah. that. When we just uh, did a podcast on First Peter, and we looked at that <clears throat> that verse, and you know. It also says honor Christ as as holy, or I, I believe <laughs> Christ is Lord. But so there's a, there's there's Old Testament times and things like that yeah. too. Yeah. What, what okay? What, Anyways, when you okay. when you say the brand of apologetic, what who do you have in mind, or what do you have in mind? I, I don't like to mention names uh, yeah. because I, in fact, in the original manuscript for that book, I did not mention any names, and I got it back and said you got to name names. And so I, Bill Craig to me represents the best of. The worst. <laughs> um, so, I mean, my, my big issue really is, if, I mean, first of all, I think Nathan and I understand postmodernism differently. I don't think postmodernism, I mean, I'm against certain postmodernist moves for sure. I mean, it, it's, it would, to me, saying I'm against postmodernism, like saying I'm against pre-modernism. Oh, what? So like you think Aquinas is an idiot or I'm against modernism. Oh, you think that Descartes didn't say anything helpful or John Locke, who I probably disagree with more than anyone. They're very brilliant people. They make some really important points. Bacon, you know, you can name all of these modern philosophers mm -hmm. to say I'm against modernism is 
is tricky unless you talk about the modern project, right? So the modern project of trying to establish through a new understanding of human reason, and that's to me critical in the book, is that what happens in modernity is we start to understand human reason in a way that Aquinas and Augustine and Anselm and Justin Martyr could never think of human reason. They could never think of it as the thing that humans possess that establishes them over and against the universe. They could not think of it that way. They don't think of the universe as brute, inert. They think of it as a cosmos. The only way to make the best way that that they could make sense of it was to say there had to be a reason and a mind. And if you go with Stoic philosophers, there had to be reasons, the logicoi spermaticoi that were uh, you know, spread out throughout all of creation uh, mm -hmm. that we bump into. Uh, and so the move that happens, and one of the things that I really go at in the book as well is when people like Bill Craig goes back and just uses Aquinas or Aristotle, but Aquinas is much better because he's later and much more refined and says, oh, hey, look, he's doing what we're doing. <laughs> no, he's not doing what you're doing. And he's not trying to do this, pull himself up by his bootstraps uh, and argue someone into the kingdom of God. That is not what Aquinas is trying to do. Sorry. So while I think that Aquinas gives us an incredible grammar for Christian belief, uh, and, and how Christians see the world. And there's a whole lot that someone who doesn't agree with it is going to have to work through if they're going to disagree with Christians uh, mm -hmm. who appeal to Aquinas to say, hey, we've got a way of talking about the world and looking at the world that makes sense of it in this way. And if you reject that, you're probably just being silly because you're going to have to do that with an awful lot of forethought and, and carefulness. Um, but at the end of the day, it doesn't rest on that. And so for me, the move that happens with the postmoderns to say epistemology or human reason uh, just simply doesn't ground itself is the critical one. And so once you accept that, I, I was looking for a new paradigm. And so I'm very happy to move to what I call the hermeneutical paradigm as opposed to epistemological paradigm. So rather than trying to ask the question, how do I prove that what I believe is right. It's like, how do I make sense of the world, uh, given my location and what I've experienced in it? Um, and of course, that is does not mean that those other questions are unimportant and we have to wrestle with them. Uh, yeah. But this whole project that I'm against is the one that says, hey, listen, I can prove to you that Christianity is the most reasonable thing. And that if you don't, well, one of the my favorites is when you say, you, you know, you can't be good if, if you don't believe in God, there's no goodness is impossible. I was like, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, there's a whole lot of intellectual incoherence in the lives of a lot of other people um, mm -hmm. and <laughs> they were, who call yeah. themselves Christians. And, and uh, you know, the goal for me, the, Kierkegaard transformed my idea of what it means to be a Christian. And Kierkegaard is not about collecting beliefs and having objective events happen to you. Uh, whether that be you got up when the right preacher was preaching and 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 made a statement and signed a card, or, uh, which would be sort of one version of that, or another be you would have the Baptist preacher, you know, acknowledge your hand when you waved your hand, <laughs> and yeah. you know now you're a Christian. Um, he's he's saying you know the essence of being a Christian is that your life matches your confession of Jesus Christ as Lord. Yeah. Um, and well, so yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, come come back on that, Nathan. I don't know if you uh, um, yeah, want I to give a few questions for him, part. actually, if that's okay. Yeah, but, by the so, way, Nathan, I, I did want to say I really like your 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 little label of critical premodernity because I could be happy with a critical premodernity um, as well. I, I don't mind that as long as someone isn't saying they can have a premodernity the way the premoderns did. Sure, because we've sure, gone sure. through the modern. That's mood. right. There's no way to kind of yeah, repristinate that. that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was thinking um, after I said that, that I think John Milbank, I'm not really a fan of, but back in the 90s, he wrote a paper that had post-critical Augustinianism in the title. And so that's kind of uh, it's pretty similar to what I said. Um, yeah. So I can't no, take, no, take much credit for it. Um, <laughs> but anyways, um, so... One thing I was wondering when I was reading your book is you do make this very strong contrast between pre-modernity and modernity. And 
what I took you to be saying oftentimes when you were making those uh, points or when you were offering that argument is that um, a, a emphasis on the universality and the objectivity of, of reason and argumentation is a modern thing and it's not a pre-modern thing. Um, and I, I find that hard to hard to follow or hard to understand because when I read plenty of pre-moderns, it sounds like they very much are thinking that they're making arguments that should yeah. be found reasonable by anybody. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, if, yeah, I could see why you might come away from that thinking that. Uh, except for me, it's really the modern cluster of objectivity, universality, and neutrality that have to come together. Um, mm -hmm. And in the way that moderns put them together, that is fundamentally different than okay. than pre-moderns and so I, I find a real helpful treatment of that shift to happen in the work of charles taylor uh the canadian roman catholic philosopher out of mcgill um because he highlights what that the, the different conceptions of the self right so in the pre-moderns you have a porous self who are you know capable of being in uh, affected and maybe even infected by their environment um and and you have with moderns we imagine the self to be this buffered thing where the the reason is actually the thing that keeps us away from the universe and, and we rationalize the universe and so that's what i'm trying to capture in that move and i try to do it with those three cl clustered concepts of universality neutrality and objectivity and that objectivity itself is is presupposed to be something that comes from human beings sort of abstracting themselves from their environment. Um, whereas um, even when pre-moderns talk that way, they don't mean the same thing um, at all, because it's really clear because of the assumptions that they're making, uh, particularly if it's rooted in Aristotle and Plato. Um, and so they are definitely, uh, yeah, so that that's the answer to the question. But I understand why you might. That that's a good question. Um, okay. Because let I, me try I, to. One of the things I didn't to, really draw out. Sorry, and then I'll let you draw out clearly in the book is well, what would I do with pre mod pre modernity? I didn't really address that very much at all. And so there's a whole bunch of questions that one could ask about that. Sorry, go ahead. Well, well I want to know what's the importance of that question. So is the is the is the basic understanding that modern man understands his reasoning capacity in a different way than yeah. pre-modern man that basically we think that we're a lot smarter than we are. Whereas pre-modern man had a more sort of uh, humility about well, what he, he could act, 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 sort of ascertain. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question because it kind of is really practical. Um, it's much more uh, like the humility is not necessarily something that they had because they were humble people, but they just understood that reason humans access to the reasons of the universe was not unlimited and they had to depend on the gods yeah. uh, or, or God himself, okay. depending okay. on who it was. And what happens in, and it's, it, it's like overt what happens in, in the modern enlightenment project is suddenly human reason is the thing that's omnicompetent. It's omni, like it has the ability to do what, and we still talk this way. We have the ability yeah. to do whatever we want because we're smart enough. Yeah, and I and I do think that does have very practical ramifications because I think if you talk to your average unbeliever, they're extremely hubristic about what they actually you know think that they know, um, and so what it, the human it, potential you know. to know is. Like, yeah, but it, it's human reason that's going to do it for us. Yeah, but Nathan, did you sort of take issue with the idea that? I mean, do, do no, you, I mean, do you, I understand what what he's saying better now that he's explained it. Um, because he is right that in modernity, there's this idea that reason should be applicable to anything and everything. And mm -hmm. whatever is not applicable, uh, whatever reason is not applicable to is irrelevant, right? Or, or it's just yeah, not yeah. even something you can talk about, like you see with yeah, the logical yeah. positivists, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, you assign it to some other category and mm -hmm. it's might be fun and nice, but it's not helpful. Yeah. Right. What other questions did you have though, Nathan? Um, well, one other thing I, I will mention that I would just appreciate hearing what your thoughts are is that I got the impression reading the book and you can clarify if this was not the right impression to get, but um, I got the impression that for you doing apologetics with 
you know, arguments and things like that is actually, um, it, it's immoral or it's not something that, that should be done. And I took you to be saying that because you felt like it was something coercive. Is that, is that uh, right? Well, no, you're, you're definitely right to tie in the ability to be coercive with, uh, one's making an argument. Um, and there was a real careful move that I made there. Um, I, I, I referenced and made a parallel move to what JL Austin does with how to do things with words, where he makes what I think is probably a pretty obvious point, but one that was overlooked prior to him largely by philosophers, and that we don't just use words to mean stuff, we use them to do all kinds of things. Um, so like some words are commands and we use words to just do a whole variety of actions so we can use words to do stuff and i and i said well the same is actually true with arguments as well uh because the bad sort of brand apologetics that i want to get away from is the kind that says i've got an argument and you're going to listen to it and it's going to make you into a christian or you're going to have to change your mind or you're going to be forced to be on my team or whatever it is right i mean these are all really you know sort of reductio ad absurdum not everybody thinks this way but you certainly get the impression that some people do and i've been in situations where that's happened right um and so uh the point that i was making there is that um the the very nature of christ's invitation means that we can't coerce someone into accepting it um, and because if you do that, you're not proclaiming the gospel, um, uh, because the gospel is good news. Um, and it is to free people from oppression as Christ says it when he uses the, the language of Isaiah in. Yeah. So, so, so basically Nathan needs to stop trying to brainwash people. So just... if there was... No, 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 no. no. Uh, so I'm not against using arguments okay. at all. So there's already have like... good conversations with right. people that say, I don't understand why Christians would say something like that. You could say, well, I mean, we do have an explanation for how the earth comes around. Well, you mean God right, right. said pops into the, well, I mean, think about it. This is, you know, if you look at what Aquinas is saying, here's, here's how we understand the world. Like, and, and it's, a, it's an explanation that is really good right and so having mm -hmm. these 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 conversations are fine in certain contexts I, i'm not against that it's okay. when Look, well, come, come back on that Nathan. yeah i probably don't disagree uh with him on this point i think that um you know you have to you have to know how to approach people you need to know who they are and where they're at and i think that there needs to be some kind of openness on their part um to, to hearing what you have to say and if there's not um then you know you're not gonna it's gonna be kind of productive probably to try to to argue with them so i think you know if if he would agree with that then we don't really have much to argue about on that point no i yeah. absolutely absolutely agree with that i would and i would say you know maybe you should buy them supper or something you know, <laughs> yeah. you know like like you do say you know show them that you value them as a person in some way um, mm -hmm. because that's what Jesus does. He values them as a person. Um, he doesn't value them as somebody who can, who, who can be a soul that can be saved. He doesn't, mm -hmm. uh, except insofar as that is something that's important for them as a person. He doesn't value them, you know, because they'll be on his team or because it'll, mm -hmm. you know, prove that they're right after all. Um, right. right. You know. I definitely think there's a way to do apologetics that's just obnoxious for lack of a better word. And, yeah. and doing apologetics that way is, is actually going to be detrimental. Yeah. Let me, let me ask this. Um, in fact, we did it. We, John Warwick Montgomery gave a, a lecture here in Houston. We attended it and then we reviewed it. So it's a few podcast episodes back. Nathan, if you might want to listen to that, because uh, I have some critiques. I actually was kind of surprised at some of the things that he said. One of the things that he said because he kind of seemed to be fighting it he actually does mention presuppositionalism at one point kind of seems to be fighting a little war against it as he's presenting but one of the things he said was that basically you know yeah sin is a real problem you know when it comes to sort of what a, a person sort of coming to faith um, but it's not such a great problem 
that it can't be overcome. And I thought well, that's kind of weird as a Lutheran because we're pretty kind of big on sin, you know, mm -hmm. like we kind of think it's a pretty substantial problem. Now, he was, he was, it, this gets into what's called like, I think the noetic effects of sin, right? Like is sin such a grave problem that yeah. um, it actually has not only hampered our, you know, our soul, but our, our minds, you know, in, uh, as well, like our ability, not just to, to reason about things, but maybe it's uh, our desire to reason about things in the right way, you know, kind of like the professor, uh, Myron, who was like, yeah, I, I know it. I know all the arguments. I just don't want to be a Christian. Um, so uh, a question to both of you would be, and this is a real divide in apologetics. I mean, the presuppositional approach, I think, exists because of its foundational defense of the anthropology of man being sinful, and, and there is an inability on man's part to, to, to come to faith, uh, even through sort of clever argumentation, if you will. I'm, sim I'm simplifying. But what do you guys think is the role of sin? Uh, how much does it limit us, and what how should that influence our sort of apologetic methodology? Nathan, you go first. Okay. Um, well, I am a confessional Lutheran, so I'm going to affirm <laughs> that we can't convert ourselves. And, um, you know, anything, any faith that we have is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, what I will say is that the Spirit uses a variety of means um, to draw people into his church or into Christ's body. And I think arguments for some people can be, uh, you know, some of those, some of those means, um, for others, you know, perhaps not. Um, so the Holy Spirit works in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that, like I said earlier, I think the point of apologetics is really just to get somebody to, um, grow in receptivity to hearing about Christianity. Um, and so I think it's like something that, the spirit is doing prior perhaps to somebody hearing the gospel, right? Something that's kind of mm -hmm. just softening that person up, softening the heart, making them more ready uh, to hear more amenable to the message. And so I would just say that that's what an apologist is really doing. Um, just providing it an additional means through which the spirit can work. Um, yeah. Not a necessary means, not one that the spirit can't work apart from, but it is, um, one that I think the spirit does use. And I just think that, you know, we can tell just by, you know, consulting um, people that have converted because of, you know, reading apologetics or, or listening to different arguments or different reasons for why different accounts, as, as uh, Myron put it, for why one would be a Christian. Um, since people have claimed that that played a role, I'm willing to take their word for it and assume mm -hmm. that um, the spirit was actually working through those means. What do you think, Myron? Are people so sinful they can't, uh, you know, find their find their way through an argument without the Spirit's help, or they can do it on their own, or what? Well, I am a confessional Anglican or Episcopalian in the states, and so that means I don't necessarily believe that, but I actually do believe it because I am mm -hmm. a biblical Christian. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you can't read Saint Paul and believe that he's inspired and right and deny the noetic effects of sin. <laughs> Paul is utterly clear that the sin of certain pagans and Gentiles, uh, because of the hardness of the heart uh, of their heart, God gives them over uh, to the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart, and they don't understand God. Uh, they don't understand the world and so on. So I absolutely believe that it has a, a profound uh, effect on, on our apologetic situation. And so, um, we have to acknowledge that. Um, I absolutely have no problems with what I guess how I understand what Nathan is saying and that, um, you know, the Holy Spirit can use literally anything. Uh, the thing is, <laughs> that that's a bit of a double edged sword for apologists, because they don't even have to be good apologists, because they could be really bad ones making bad arguments. Uh, and John Warwick Montgomery would hate that. Um, but I believe that he could use that because the Holy Spirit is calling all people to Christ. That's what the Spirit does convicting them of sin and the coming judgment and bringing them uh, to a saving knowledge of Christ. And so um, I, I, I definitely think being willing to engage people intellectually where they're at on questions that they have and show them how you're wrestling with your own understanding of life and faith in God, which none of us ever gets right. Um, and none of us has the great answers. And 
if if you're if you're going to go by the current state of any debate on any of the arguments, none of the arguments actually work either. Uh, you just have to kind of go with a consensus, which often apologists will say, you know, the consensus of scholars is. Or Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You <laughs> you're saying are you are you saying that the 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 main arguments put forth by conventional evidential apologists, we'd say you don't you, you would say they don't work. You think they have good rejoinders significant enough that they are they the, I'll, I'll just say this the debate is still going on because we can't settle the debate with the possible exception of Alvin Plantinga's free will defense for uh the logical problem of evil there doesn't seem to be much that people can say about that gotcha. uh, but that's a pretty modest argument that basically says you know there has to well, be. I mean, Greg Bonson says that he basically says, well, if you're making if you're making a cumulative case or no, you know, both might hate Greg Bonson, but he says, you know, if I you're making a cumulative cumulative case argument, but each argument along the way has certain flaws or their problem. I mean, that was his main objection. He, he doesn't like the probabilistic argument now. And I wanted yeah. to come back to this question of certainty. Um, in fact, if y'all have ever uh, listened to I think it's on YouTube now, you don't have to pay for it. It's easy to find. But he debated or conversed with um, R.C. Sproul. I think it was in 1977. He, he and, uh, if you, Bonson? Yeah, Greg Bonson, yeah. And um, I, I've listened to it many times. And one of the main points, there's a, several. One, one of, of great uh, interest was the Romans 1. They both talk about Romans 1, and they have a disagreement about uh, whether people have a immediate or an immediate knowledge of God. Because that's kind of what Paul's talking about. Like people have, they have sufficient knowledge of God, but they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So it's a question of, well, when they have sufficient knowledge of God, is that mediated through something else, or is it immediate by virtue of say they're being made in God's image? Greg Bonson took the immediate position. You know, R.C. Sproul took the immediate position. So that's pretty a, a very fine point on things. But it, it it's it it really gets down to anthropology once again. Like, what is the nature of man's relationship to God, and therefore that informs our apologetic enterprise, or at least it could. Um, but the other issue was um, certainty. Um, so Greg Bonson, and he pulled, you know, he proof texted a number of texts that talked about the fact that people can have absolute certainty uh, in, uh, in, in, in faith. And at the end of the day, R.C. Sproul said they can't, that and they, they kind of use this crime scene analogy, right? Where like you could have all the evidence that points in one direction, you know, but there could still be some reason for uncertainty or something like that. And so anyway, I, I thought it was, I thought, I thought it's, it's, I, I would, sorry, that was a rant on my behalf. I said, I wasn't going to do right. that, but, but I think That's it would good. be worth, I, I, I think I would be curious to know where you guys sort of, what you think about certainty, because when you start talking about something like post-modernity, that is the air we breathe. I mean, you know, people mm -hmm. people don't even know it, right? But 99% of people are fully committed, I would argue, postmodernists because it's just all they've ever known. And to basically draw someone to a position of certainty seems like almost a Herculean effort, apart from the spirit of God, of course. What do y'all think about certainty, though? Is certainty something we can know as Christians about our Christian claims, or do we sort of end up with highly probable arguments. And since I've been picking on Nathan so much to go first, Ma Myron, maybe you go first this time. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, the short answer is, um, th well, there's, there's at least, <laughs> this is not the short answer. <laughs> I'm not going to give you the short answer. Uh, you know, there's, there's two kinds of certainty, of course, there's subjective certainty, which means I'm absolutely convinced, uh, but I don't have objective certainty, even if I think I do, because I'm in fact wrong. Um, but you can be absolutely convinced of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I would say you could be absolutely convinced of something. Objective certainty is something completely different, which I don't think we have access to. Uh, because I think that's built into the very nature of ourselves as finite, limited creatures um, whose minds are finite and limited. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, um, uh, where where I go with this is, you know, Paul says that the opposite of faith is not doubt, it's sin, and Kierkegaard qualifies sin as despair, and so the opposite of mm. faith is not doubt, it's despair, um, and so it's it's an existential posture that would include object of doubting, but much more as a willed stance, so the will has to be involved there too. Yeah. Um, and by the way, Easter too, the text is always doubting Thomas. So I'm, it, that's true for you guys too, right? Yeah. 
John, John 20, uh, 19 to 31, I guess. So yeah. I, and th this is actually a very appropriate conversation for that text. But so say that again, though, the, the opposite of faith uh, well, is isn't doubt, it's sin. Okay. Um, and the so, opposite. So Paul doesn't oppose those two. He doesn't oppose okay. faith and doubt. He opposes faith and sin. Gotcha. So okay. Lack of faith is to be in sin. The answer to sin is faith, right? Yeah. And for Kierkegaard, he just goes on to qualify. He, he, that, that sin is despair. It, it's experienced okay. existentially as despair. Right. Um, and he qualifies that out the wazoo. Yeah. <laughs> like he goes on to name like a whole bunch of all the logical possibilities for what despair is. Uh, but basically it's a refusal. It's it, it, the thing about Kierkegaard that makes it important here is that, um, that doubt might just be viewed by modern people as a cognitive operation. And so he wants to make it something that's part of the whole person so that it's actually involving the will because without will, there's no sin. And so, uh, yeah. despair is a willed, uh, condition. Yeah. And if we champion reason, I think one of the pitfalls could be that we're, we're sort of putting doubt, we're putting doubt as an intellectual possibility rather as a result of sin. So I, I would be in the camp. I mean, I guess I'm, well, and I guess see I'm my, Pauline. I didn't even know it, but I want Nathan to come back yeah. before I, yeah. And my story with my professor, Dr. Preuss, uh, illustrates that, right? He, he refused, right? Yeah, yeah. But so certainty, Nathan, what do you think? Um, I wouldn't say that we can have absolute certainty about anything for the same reasons Myron pointed out or finite or fallible. However, I do think there are a number of things that it really makes no sense to doubt. There's just no, no good reason to doubt them. And I would, you know, I see these things as um, the kinds of principles that were used by pre-modern thinkers, pre-modern philosophers, the things that they believed could be taken for granted. And I think there are a number of those things that can fairly be taken for granted. And to, to raise doubts about those things um, doesn't really make any sense. It's, it's irrational to doubt those things. So on the basis of those things, I think we can have a significant amount of knowledge about things. Um, it's limited always. It's always, um, you know, it's always touched by our shortcomings as knowers. However, um, I don't think, I don't think a posture of skepticism, um, generally speaking is appropriate. So because of these, because of these mm -hmm. things that we can be confident, I think, in believing, um, yeah. there's an Anglican philosopher named Joseph Butler, who famously said that probability is the guide to life. And I think that that's generally speaking the truth. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, I think that there's a lot of wisdom in that saying, just because I, like I said, I don't think absolute certainty due to our innate or inherent limitations is, is a real possibility for us. Even the things that we uh, feel most certain about, we can always ask, you know, am I somehow mistaken, right? Or am I somehow deceived? Um, and like I said, it doesn't, for a lot of things, that question should just be dismissed immediately because it serves no purpose, right? Nothing is gained by kind of, you know, contemplating it or considering it. So like, for example, um, you know, is there a table in front of me right now? Like in my view to, to really ask questions of that nature is just pointless. Um, so I wouldn't even raise them, but can I have absolute certainty that there's a table in front of me right now? Um, no, I would say I can't. So that's what I would say about that. And okay. as far as, uh, I would say also just the thing about the opposite of faith being sin, I would say yes, but in my view, um, sin is essentially unbelief. I mean, that's the nature of sin is unbelief. So, all right, or I would say at least that there's no sin that doesn't have unbelief as one of its constituent elements. Um, so yeah, those are my thoughts yeah, on those yeah. things. Well, we, we've gone for about an hour and I don't want to keep you guys any longer, but I had a couple more questions if y'all have a few more minutes. Um, and uh, I wanted to sort of tie back to the, the kind of popular level of apologetics. One of my, as I sort of got into apologetics, I was very glad to have found it because as a Christian, I sort of needed kind of to put some gas in my tank. Mm -hmm. uh, and I kind of got burned out on, you know, maybe following politics too closely or doing some other things. And 
that all seemed to kind of come to a dead end. And I kind of realized, hey, if I want people to agree with my worldview, then they need to share my faith because that's so foundational. Well, how do I share my faith? How do I convince other people, right? So I really got into apologetics. But after a while, what I found sort of dismaying was the realization that most apologetics was probably done in Christian circles, right? So it was like conferences with Christians learning about apologetics, but I wasn't sure if they were ever actually doing any evangelism and putting themselves in a position to, you know, teach that. So maybe one question would be something like, is apologetics as a task or as a discipline different for believers than it is for unbelievers? I probably think it is, but that said, that distinction seems to never be made in the apologetics world. Um, so I'm curious if y'all think, and, and basically what I'm arguing is the, is the unbeliever and the believer on equal footing um, as they, in, in the way that they receive information or the motivations behind receiving information, or basically should I just kind of plead ignorance and just go about it? Um, but what do you, do, do y'all think that sort of, you could almost have like apologetics A and apologetics B, you know, for almost kind of different groups of people? Um, do you want me to go first? Sure. Okay. Because I just feel like Nathan's been put on the spot too much. And then yeah. I get to come along and say, well, now that I've heard what you said. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I, yeah, I have to be careful, I guess. Um, I, I think, first of all, I know, I have noted many times, and in fact, bring something up similar in the end of apologetics, that the bulk of what apologetics seems to be about is is, uh, you know, conversation with Christians um, that Christians have with themselves to make themselves feel better. And sometimes I think they need to feel worse. Um, my, my fundamental, uh, uh, well, and let me also say this, that like Bill Craig will say up front that one of the virtues or, or you know, thing, gifts that apologetics has is to build up the faith of unbeliever. I mean, of believers. Uh -huh. um, and so that's how he would justify the fact that 90% of the people that come to his seminars are Christians. Uh, although he does debates um, where there are a few more unchristians in them. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, my, my big problem is that it teaches people that their faith is about having answers to questions. And for me, the faith is about responding to the claims of Jesus on your life. And I'm sure Nathan is going to dispute that, that and say something like, well, um, I don't think those two are mutually exclusive. Um, but the way I look at them is that we, if we teach people that an having answers to questions is what faith is all about, then if they can't do it, and some people just aren't smart enough to do it, let's say that first of all. And some people are also not, uh, inclined to do it, um, then they can run into huge problems. And I have seen that uh, with the people that I grew up with, they go off to university and they find out, oh, there are actual objections to the stuff that everybody taught me was just God's own truth. And then they don't know what to do because they've been told that you, we are the answer people. And then the answers that we've been given have no basis because they can't supply them with a basis. And then suddenly those answers are now bad answers. And I'm like, oh, you know, just because uh, you know, Mr. Jans in grade six told me that we believe that Jesus rose, rose from the dead because of, you know, the validity of the historical witness. And then I find out that there are huge questions that some historical scholars have about that, and I can't answer them. Now, suddenly, I have to think that Jesus maybe wasn't the son of God after all, because I was told that that's the basis on which we believe it. And I'm like, eh, that's not really why I believe it. Um, and that's where um, yeah, that, well, yeah. That's... well, I will, I will say if I have to do analytical philosophy, like you guys were hinting at earlier, I'm, I'm out, I'm too stupid for that. So if that's what apologetics is, I'm, I'm done, but, um, but okay, Nathan, maybe come back on that. Um, well, I think that, yeah, I do think there's a place for both. I, I think Myron's point is important that, you don't want to encourage people that to think that they need to have an answer for everything. Um, you know, as Lutherans, we, we definitely don't think that way, but I think a lot of evangelicals do um, just because we do embrace things that are, you know, manifestly paradoxical, right. In terms of our, our doctrine. So 
we don't necessarily think along those lines, but um, I do think that that's a pitfall that a lot of people do fall into, or at least are, um, or, you know, it's a hazard for them. Um, because yeah, we're never going to understand everything and everything that we say is, uh, could probably be said better. Everything could be thought through more. Everything, you know, could be, um, whatever we're able to, to find that appears reasonable to us, you know, it could always be made more so probably. Um, so we're just always kind of uh, in the middle of things, right? We're always kind of on the way, you might say. And um, we're never going to be able to answer every objection. We're never going to be able to um, figure out the, the perfect answer to a lot of, you know, quandaries that we face. But um, I do think it's important to at least provide enough reasons or evidence for people to feel that they've got at least one foot on a pretty solid foundation. And so even if there are other things that they are unsure about and they can't plant that second foot, they've got one foot that's planted. And, and because of that, they feel confident that the fact that they can't answer these other questions is not really that big of a deal or that yeah. pressing of a difficulty. Now, if they felt like that way about everything, then I would say that would be a pretty significant problem, right? Because then I don't know why anybody would choose to be a Christian, right? If they felt that way about any objection to the faith, mm -hmm. right? So I think we do have to have a certain um, stockpile, you might say, of answers on hand that we can um, resort to or we can um, look to when you know, these kinds of difficult, really difficult questions arise that we struggle with. We need to be able to point to some things that we are actually quite confident about, quite sure about, and, um, and that reassure us. Mm -hmm. And as far as like, you know, apologetics um, conferences go and things like this, where you've got, you know, almost everybody there is a believer. I do think that they're useful because I think that they do help Christians become more confident. And I think that evangelism without confidence is a very difficult thing to achieve. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to see much evangelism where there's not much confidence. And I do think apologetics does have some role in boosting people's confidence. It might not, um, you know, it might not be a significant, a huge amount, but, or a highly significant amount, but it might make some difference. And and for that reason, I would say that I see these things as worthwhile because I do think it makes people more willing to put themselves out there and, and engage with others, knowing that they might get some kind of pushback. They might get some kind of um, question, you know, that they will feel like they will at least have some idea, hopefully, of how to answer. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and for that reason, I think that the whole apologetics enterprise of kind of, you know, training people. Uh, training Christians to understand some of the basic, you know, arguments and defenses that apologists use, I do think there's there's value in that. Um, precisely because, like I said, I think you need to at least feel confident about some things in order to be able to look past or, or you know, not see the things that you can't comprehend or can't provide an answer for as being a really significant problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, you know, it, it would be wrong of me, I think, to totally sort of poo-poo apologetics as an enterprise, because I do think it gave me confidence, and it was sort mm -hmm. of there for me when I needed it, um, if you will. And I'll say just, just as a kind of an aside, but I think that if we're willing to do evangelism, and by the way, I think every congregation needs to have evangelism and apologetic strategies and, and opportunities and things of that nature. I don't think many congregations do. Uh, and I think that's too bad. But I think um, I think that um, when we're on the 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 battlefield, if you will, or we're in the harvest, uh, we have to, you know, we should use common sense and sort of discern different situations. I think sometimes you come across a genuine mocker or scoffer, to use sort of biblical mm -hmm. language, and then there are sincere seekers, and those are sort of two people in very different, you know, situations. Mm -hmm, and right. you wouldn't handle that the same. I don't think you'd give each of them, you know, the Kalam cosmological argument. You know, one might just need yeah. an old-fashioned call to repentance. Um, right. You know, so I, I would say, you know, I think that having a, a I think what was you use the word, uh, uh, anyway, ammo, ammo, 
at the ready. There was a word you used. Stockpile, yeah. Stockpile. It's kind of a a storehouse, you might say, right? Yeah. Maybe that's a better term. Storehouse. Yeah, yeah. Like, Um, you know, Pharaoh in Egypt and all that. Yeah, a granary or something. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Okay, well, any any last thing I want to point out before we go uh, that uh, Kierkegaard was a Lutheran. (laughs) Just FYI. That's and, true. Uh, so basically, you're at number Luther, 31 here. Is what Luther saying. had really harsh things to say about uh, at called reason names that probably mm-hmm. you don't want mentioned on the podcast. He used, yeah. he used some choice language about reason, mm-hmm. um, like um, ladies of the night or something, maybe. Yeah, 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 uh-huh. yeah and yeah. female dogs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> called it that female dog, lady of the night, reason. <laughs> I mean, I. He it, does distinguish though between use and abuse, right? No, no, I'm proper just, use I, for reason. And I, he has I was no just, problems with that. Okay, no, yeah. I, I'm told that was just yeah, right. And and to be fair, Luther called everything a female dog. <laughs> so I mean, you know, like at different at different points, you know. So true, um, true. No, yeah, was, uh, yeah. I, I love Luther. Um, yeah, I I don't have a lot to say, um, except that you know, with someone like like Nathan, I definitely don't see him as the person who's the target of my book. Um, But for me, I think where I see us disagreeing really fundamentally is, uh, uh, and and maybe at least in terms of theory, is that I just think with Kierkegaard that our faith does not rest uh, on anything that is rational. Um, in the sense that, and that, that does not mean that it's not reasonable. It does not mean it can't be reasoned about. And so I think, uh, we have to be very careful, um, that we don't commit cognitive idolatry, uh, when we start to get really exuberant about, about both how we believe and get blinded by our hubris, but also that we don't sell people something about what they think, what we think faith is, that it actually is not faith at all um that is nothing but wood hay and stubble um and so that that's my big concern in the book um i definitely think that uh there's lots of room for rational argumentation Uh, i don't think what christians believe is uh ridiculous in fact i think quite the opposite but i think it will appear ridiculous at some point to someone who is not a christian yeah and i know luther or uh, nathan would agree with that and I, i don't yeah, yeah, I didn't think Nathan would disagree with any of those statements. So, yeah, I'd like to think none of us are idolatrous, to be fair. So, um, but we <laughs> should all be. I think we should. I do think we should all possess some some humility about uh, what we really can grasp about. Sure. All I mean, I, I see apologetics yeah. as a department of theology, and I mm-hmm. think that theologians have to have a humble posture. I think there's no other yeah. way to do theology. Yeah, not 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 if yeah, not if God exists, you know, or we right. think He exists. Yeah, yeah. If we're right about that, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, okay, um, how do guys find you? First of all, it's Myron B, as in Bradley Penner, not the other Canadian Myron Penner. Learn that lesson the uh, well, not super hard way, but because the other Myron Penner is awfully a very nice guy too. But oh, where awesome. do people find you, uh, Myron, if they want to connect uh, with you? Yeah, um, you can email me at Myron at, that's M-Y-R-O-N, at St. Paul's, S-T-P-A-U-L-S hyphen Anglican dot C-A. Um, yeah, cool. just give, give me an email, cool. give me a shout. And, and, and get the book, uh, The End yeah. of Apologetics. And yeah. Nathan order, Mer- order 15 of them. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, and, Nathan Merkin, and Nathan, tell us the name of the book that people should order 15 of yours. It's called Christian Apologetics, a Lutheran introduction. Cool. And uh, it's written for conservative Lutherans. If you're not a conservative Lutheran, you might find some value in it. But if you're not a conservative, just you know, there's Lutheran, probably some things in there you won't like too. So yeah, if you're not a conservative <laughs> Lutheran, from what I can tell, you're you're well on your way to paganism. So having no. having left uh, the more liberal uh, Lutheran body, I can say that now. Uh, where do people find you, Nathan? I know you're on Facebook. I think I'm friends with. Uh, you. Yeah, Facebook. Um, Greeley Nathan W at gmail.com cool um, and I'm on right. Facebook as well okay. Facebook, Facebook and Twitter cool um, and uh, HoustonTOT.com of course learn more about Theology on Tap Theology on Air and what we're doing like us give us good reviews it's all appreciated uh, I'm Evan McClanahan you can find me at First Lutheran FLHouston.org and until next time we encourage you to question freely think deeply and disagree as needed mm-hmm.